Hello everybody, welcome to today's lecture. Uh, today we are going to be speaking about the decade of the 1950s. Uh, an extraordinarily iconic, yet in many ways mythical, um, decade. And, and the reason why I say this is because you frequently hear, or at least I have heard, uh, that the United States sort of had a golden age, and that golden age is the decade of the 1950s. This is a time when the, the greatest generation um, had uh, numerous children with the baby boom. They defeated fascism, and they came back triumphant, right? And the United States uh, dived into the American dream, a dream where one could have two and a half children, a dog, a cat, a, a white picket fence in a house, and, and life was idyllic. This, of course, uh, is mythological. Indeed, families, uh, in many ways, have never been perfect. They have always been, uh, as one historian, Stephanie Kuntz, argues in her book, The Way We Never Were, American Families and the Nostalgia Trap. She says, I want to show that families have always been in flux and often in crisis. Knowing that there was no golden age of family life, I believe, would enable people to deal more effectively with the problems facing today's families than if they continue to romanticize about the quote-unquote good old days. Well, the good old days, of course, is this decade of the 1950s. And while it is my intention primarily with this lecture to cover the economic and cultural trends of the 1950s, I think it didactic to begin by realizing that the 1950s was a phenomenon in and to itself. The family structure that one recalls from the 1950s and memorialized in various reruns from that period in their sitcoms, right? These types of nuclear families where the children go to school and mom stays home and she gleans all of her worth from being a mother and a wife and the father goes out and earns the bacon, right? This type of nuclear family structure not only was uncommon to most of American history, but the reality is, is that that particular model worked really well for white Protestant middle-class Americans. It was not something that you could say universally was true of most Americans. And I want to go back to Stephanie Kuntz in her book, The Way We Never Were, and she writes, despite ever mounting evidence that families of the past were not as idyllic and families of the present not as dysfunctional as they are often portrayed, many political leaders and opinion makers in the United States continue to filter our changing family experiences and trends through the distorted lens of historical mythologizing about past family life. In other words, what she's arguing here is that we hearken back to this decade of the 1950s and we romanticize about it. And when we point out the dysfunction that we see in certain families within the United States, whether they be nuclear families or homosexual families or single mother or single father, whatever the dysfunction that certain people may see, this, this particular author is going to argue that they hearken back to the 1950s and simply say that if we could go back to that model, then the problems that currently face the United States would be corrected. She writes in her second chapter, and I'm going to continue to read from her book, she writes, our most powerful visions of traditional families, and she would in fact argue that the traditional family, the nuclear family of the 1950s, is in fact not a traditional version of the American family, but she goes on to state that our most powerful visions of traditional families derive from images that are still delivered to our homes in countless reruns of 1950s television sitcoms. When liberals and conservatives debate family policies, for example, the issue is often framed in terms of how many Aussie and Harriet families are left in the United States. Liberals compute the percentage of total households that contain a breadwinner, father, a full-time homemaker, mother, and dependent children, proclaiming that fewer than 10% of American families meet the Aussie and Harriet or leave it to Beaver model. Conservatives, on the other hand, counter that more than half of all mothers with preschool children either are not employed or are employed only part-time, right? And the idea is, is that there is a continual debate about what it is the American family should be. And the reason why I talk about this is because family history is incredibly important, at least it is to me, but it is oftentimes structured around the 1950 model, okay? And that's incredibly important. She ends her second chapter by saying this, people who romanticize the 1950s or any model of the traditional family are usually put in an uncomfortable position when they attempt to gain popular support. For example, 
The legitimacy of women's rights is so widely accepted today that it only a tiny minority of Americans seriously propose that women should go back to being full-time housewives or should be denied educational and job opportunities because of their family responsibilities. And of course, for white middle-class uh, um, Protestant Americans, that was the case in the 1950s. But no one would actually suggest that we actually do this, or at least they'd be the most radical. And so I just want to preface the 1950s by having that discussion and getting you to think about the fact that perhaps it's time to renegotiate or rethink what we know is true about the 1950s so that we can have a better grasp about not only the decade, but how to deal with certain family issues that arise today. Okay. So with all that said, let's dive right into this uh, and let's talk about what the United States looked like for predominantly white middle class Americans during the 1950s, okay? All right, let's 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 do this. All right, Winston Churchill once said that America at this moment stands at the summit of the world, and he states this immediately following World War II in 1945. And what he means by that is, you know, the United States came out of World War II unscathed, right? No major conflicts occurred within the continental United States. Indeed, it did hit Hawaii, but at the time, Hawaii was not the United States. It was not yet a state, okay? And so, from the ashes of World War II, the United States emerges the most militaristically powerful, the most economically significant powerhouse in all of the world. And so, Churchill is correct. They stood at the summit of the world. It says, during the 1950s, it was easy to see what Churchill meant. The United States was the world's strongest military power. Its economy was booming. And the fruits of this prosperity, the fruits of that prosperity would include new cars, suburban homes, washers, dryers, and a variety of consumer goods, right? These were the fruits of the American prosperity during the 1950s. It says these were available to more people than ever before. The one thing that you're going to hear, and I'm going to say this more times than I need to, but the period of the 1950s was a time in which many white middle class Americans, as, long as, as well as some others, it is a time in which people are prospering. It is a time when wages are high, many people are employed, and the economy is moving. Okay, The United States went from building guns and ships to now they're building cars and washing machines. And throughout the war, people had saved money as a way to allow for other commodities to be sent across the seas to fight the war. Well, now they have lots of resources that they've not only saved, but that are coming into their coffers, and they're spending it. And they're spending it a lot on creating a certain type of family. And we'll talk more about that. It says, however, the 1950s were also an era of great conflict. And in fact, we're going to see this uh, in later lectures. Uh, the 1950s was a time when the Cold War um, boomed. Uh, where the Soviet Union and the United States uh, have ideological differences, and those differences actually manifest themselves in various conflicts, like the Korean War uh, and the Vietnam War. And again, we'll talk more about those later. Okay, there's also some race issues. Some significant civil rights movements begins in the 1950s. And so, while the war, I'm sorry, while in the 1950s is a period of prosperity, it is also a, a, a time of conflict. Today, I'm, prom I'm predominantly going to be speaking about the boom period, and I'll talk about the conflicts a little bit later. Tyndall has this to say. The dominant feature of post-World War II society was its remarkable prosperity. After a surprisingly brief post-war recession, business shifted from wartime production to the peacetime manufacture of an array of consumer goods. The economy soared to record heights. Okay, so record heights. It goes on to state that during the 1950s, government officials assured the citizenry that they should not fear another economic collapse. Rather, they should spend their money. And they did. And the United States, citizens of the United States became consumers. All right, it says historians use the word boom to describe a lot of things about the 1950s. The booming economy, the booming suburbs, and of course, the baby boom, right? And I want to talk briefly about each of these booms. Okay, then let's begin with the baby boom. It says, this boom began in 1946 when a record number of babies, approximately 3.4 million children, were born. Okay, it says about 4 million babies were born each year during the 1950s. Okay, all in all, by the time 
but the boom finally tapered off around 1960. Well, the boom actually tapered off. It began to taper off around 1957, and then it sort of stopped around 1964. But between 1946 and 1964, about 77 million people were born, and these are the baby boomers. Now, the reality is, is that when your population increases exponentially like that, it's going to put a strain on society. And for the United States, that strain actually was met. It didn't cripple the United States. Houses were built, okay? Suburban cities, I'm sorry, suburban neighborhoods were constructed, right? And a lot of that has to do with these baby boomers, okay? Let's move on. It goes on to state that after World War II ended, many Americans were eager to have children because they were confident that the future would be prosperous. You know, I have a friend who, he and his wife, they don't have children yet, and one of the things he had mentioned to me was that he was concerned about bringing children into, into the world today, you know, and, and you know, I, I didn't get too deep into the conversation with him, but it's interesting to see that some people have reservations or are hesitant uh, to have children in today's society. During the 1950s, that hesitation was gone, right? The future was bright. It was perfect, okay? And it was something that they acted on. It says here in the book America Narrative History, the return of some 12 million veterans to private life helped generate the post-war baby boom, which peaked in 1957 and then tapered off by 1964. Many young married couples who had delayed having children during the Depression or the war were now intent on making up for lost time. Between 1946 and 1964, approximately 76 to 77 million Americans were born. It goes on to state that the post-war baby boom created a massive demand for diapers, baby food, toys, medicine, schools, books, teachers, furniture, and housing. The baby boomers were raised during the 1950s and 1960s, a period of unprecedented prosperity. And one of the things that's going to be true, and we'll talk about them later, but when we get to the hippies or the counterculture, one of the things that the hippies are rebelling against is the consumerist society that they had grown up in, right? This was a group of people who grew up having high expectations because they were given everything. They didn't have to work for it in the way that their parents had to do. They didn't have to scrimp and save. They just had high expectations and assumed that society would provide them those expectations. And one of the things that's true about the counterculture or the hippies is that they were rebelling against consumerism. They were rebelling against what Americans were advertising on TV. What are they so concerned with? Well, one hippie said they were concerned with deodorant right and all this sort of thing okay it says in many ways they were right they were right it goes on to state that between 1945 and 1960 the gross national product more than doubled uh, that's what we refer to as the GNP right it grew from 200 billion dollars to more than 500 billion dollars within that 15 year time span okay and this is just uh, additional evidence of the increase of economic development during that decade. It says much of this increase came from government spending. In fact, as we will see when we get to the Cold War, the government spent quite a bit of money on um, armament races and the space race, and, and, and this really pumped a lot of money into the economy, which shored it up and, and helped it to grow. But at the same time, American citizens are consumers, and they too are pumping money into the economy. It says the construction of interstate highways and schools, the distribution of veterans' as benefits via the GI Bill, and most of all, the increase in military spending on goods like airplanes and new technologies, all of this contributed to the decade's economic prosperity. It goes on to state that rates of unemployment and inflation were low and wages were high. Middle class Americans, largely white middle class Americans, had more money to spend than ever. And this is also true for young people. Um, at, at this period in history, what we see is the development of a unique youth or subculture known as the teenage culture. And these teenagers, in many respects, had lots of money to spend. They had, you know, they're babysitting, they're mowing lawns, they have various jobs, and they have a lot of free time and money to spend. And that also not only shores up the economy because they're purchasing things, but it also, and more importantly, I think, helps to create a unique um, culture, a youth culture, and we're going to be talking more about that, but just want to, you know, foreshadow a little bit about where we're going, okay? It says, the things that people were buying included homes, okay? And so while there's a baby boom, which 
occurs in the 1950s. There's also what we call a suburban boom. Okay, and I and I assume, uh, albeit I can't know for sure, but I would assume that the majority of you probably live in suburban neighborhoods. Um, suburban neighborhoods are generally neighborhoods that are approximately close to cities, but they are not within cities, right? Um, they are generally laid out in sort of a grid pattern. The homes are close to one another. They're similar in style and construction, right? So I suspect suburban neighborhoods are pretty, pretty typical, okay? And Americans in the 1950s began to live in these suburban homes, uh, what some people called Levitt towns. And the reason why they were called that was because William Levitt was one of the first architects and developers of these sort of suburban neighborhoods. Okay? So at the same time that there's a baby boom, there's also a suburban neighborhood boom, in part because you have to have a place to put the veterans who are returning to home. You have to find a place to put these newly uh, created children, right? They have to have some place to go. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, let's move on. All right, it goes on to state here that the baby boom and the suburban boom went hand in hand. Almost as soon as World War II ended, developers, as uh, William Levitt, uh, whose Levitt towns in New York and New Jersey would become essentially uh, the prototype for uh, suburban neighborhoods at the time, and one could argue even to today, right? William Levitt and other developers began to purchase land on the outskirts of cities, outskirts of urban areas, and what they began to do is they began to mass produce and develop various techniques to allow them to construct a home, and they could construct these homes very, very rapidly. I mean, within a matter of three to four hours, you could sort of put this this framed house together. And one of the interesting things, and, and, and you'll hear this when you watch the various films that I have for you, and you definitely want to watch these films, is that many of these houses came fully furnished. You know, and, and you'll hear the people who purchased these homes refer to it as a dream. It was a dream come true, right? When we talk about what it means to have the American dream or what it means to be a part of that or to chase after it, much of what we're thinking about, at least from the overarching hegemonic notion of it, is that you have this idea of a white picket fence and a house, right? And I mentioned this before, and that's the American dream. It's the, it's the dream to own a home and to have a family. Uh, I would contend and I would argue that that's probably not everyone's dream today, and it most certainly was not a reality for most people. Uh, in or, or for many people rather during the 1950s but what we can say is that the Levitt towns it, it, it solved a need particularly the need created by these baby boomers it says in my book the post-war era witnessed a mass migration to a new frontier you know the, the final frontier space the new frontier of the 1950s are suburbia the suburbs it says the burgeoning population created new communities and required an array of new services. It says almost the entire population increase of the 50s and 60s was an urban or suburban phenomenon. Dramatic new technological advances in agricultural production reduced the need for manual labors, and so people in droves began to move out of the cities and out of rural areas and into the suburbs. It goes on to state here that William Levitt, a brassy New York developer, led the suburban revolution. In 1947, on 1,200 acres of Long Island farmland, he built 10,600 houses to be inhabited by more than 40,000 people. And you could purchase these houses for very little money. Okay? Now, one of the things I will want you to do when you get done with this slide here, so that you don't have to start it over, is to just go ahead and click on the, the link called Levitt Towns. And it's going to show you one going up. It's going to talk a little bit about what these Levitt Towns were like and what suburbia was like, okay? You definitely want to take a look at that. But one of the other things that really actually helps these suburban neighborhoods to pop up and to be used is the GI Bill. Now, today we still have the GI Bill, but the GI Bill is something that veterans received after World War II. And in addition to uh, allowing veterans to go to school, it provided them resources in order to purchase one of these suburban homes, okay? So this is the GI Bill subsidized low-cost mortgages for returning soldiers, which meant that it was often cheaper to buy one of these suburban houses than it was to rent an apartment within the city. And so the GI Bill itself contributes to this boom. But in addition to that, the GI Bill uh, is the result, if you will, of the bonus army march from World War One. Recall back when we were talking about World War One that you have, I'm sorry, not World War One, the Great Depression. World War One vets were seeking a bonus, right? Because there was nothing in place to provide aid for veterans once the wars were over. Well, the GI Bill is in part 
in response to that. Okay, it says here part of the frenzy was indirectly financed by the federal government. Fears that a sharp drop in military spending and the sudden influx of vets into the workforce would send the economy into a downward spiral. This causes Congress to pass the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, more popularly known as the GI Bill. Okay, GI meaning government issue, but it also becomes a popular phrase for referring to uh, um, servicemen, GIs. It goes on to state here that between 1944 and 1956, almost 8 million vets took advantage of $14.5 billion in GI Bill subsidies. And what did they do? They went to college. They got on-the-job training. They purchased Levittowns and other suburban homes. Okay? It says some 5 million vets bought new homes with GI Bill mortgage loans, which required no down payment and provided up to 20 years for repayment. Before World War II, approximately 160,000 Americans graduated from college each year, but by the 1950s, that would jump to over 500,000, and vets accounted for about 40% of that number. Okay, and so when we're talking about booms, when we're talking about a baby boom and you know suburban boom, part of that has to do with a burgeoning economy, but it also has to do with government intervention, such as was the case here with the GI Bill. All right, let's move forward. It goes on to state that during the Eisenhower era, Americans achieved a level of prosperity they had never known before. While other parts of the world struggled to rebuild from the devastation of World War II, citizens of the United States saw their standard of living boom, as I've already mentioned. In fact, and we will see this in further videos that we watch, you know, other nations, including the French, will send representatives over to the United States to watch production facilities, to calculate and understand the way in which the United States economy functioned because in a post-war society, particularly in Europe, the economy is, is, is in the tank. And so they want to see how to maximize efficiency and production, which the United States has done really well. And the truth is, is that's going to bring a lot of people a lot of money. It's also important to recognize that it's not just the businesses that help this production to go well. It says here that Eisenhower himself deserves a good deal of credit for this economic growth. He found the right combination of low taxes, balanced budgets, and public spending, which allowed the economy to hum along at a steady clip. He also benefited from steady growth in spending on new homes, right, and consumer goods. So it's important to know that as important as Eisenhower was to uh, the, the, the burgeoning economy, he is helped along by people spending money, right? If there is no money being spent or being pumped into the economy to shore up any loose ends, right, then you could find yourself in a recession or a dip, okay? The other thing that's going to help the economy in the 1950s is that purchasing on credit becomes something very fashionable and in vogue. The first credit card, which was a diner's club card, uh, was introduced in the 1950s, and of course, you know, the whole idea of buy now, pay later becomes very uh, appealing to people. Uh, and, of course, uh, those types of, of things allow for the economy to boom as well, okay? All right, let's move forward. All right, what accounts for all this boom? We've talked a little bit about that, but it says one of the factors that fueled the prosperity of the 50s was the increase in consumer spending. And, and, and I really want to stress this because, as I have mentioned already, the counterculture of the 1950s is going to react. I'm sorry, the counterculture of the 1960s is going to react to this consumerism, okay? And so I want to focus on that a little bit, okay? This thing says Americans enjoyed a standard of living that was inconceivable to the rest of the world. It says, for example, Vice President Richard Nixon, who will later be our president, he told Nikita Khrushchev, who was the leader of the Soviet Union, he told them in the 1950s that there were 60 million cars in the United States. It says, but the Soviet leader simply refused to believe him. When Khrushchev came to visit America, Eisenhower, who was president, arranged for him to fly in a helicopter over busy roads and parking lots to witness the remarkable signs of abundance. Since the time was ripe for Americans to change their spending patterns, and thus they did, they became consumers. Okay, both adults and children. Okay, I believe in the 1950s it was something like three cars, I think it was one car to every three people, while in Europe, it was something like ten, one car to every ten people. Um, just, just the prosperity in the United States was, was monumental. And the reason why that is, low taxes, high wages, low unemployment, 
people have lots of money and they feel good about the future. So they're pumping money into the economy. All right, moving on. It says here that the difference between a production society, which focused on meeting basic needs, and a consumption society, which emphasized a customer's desires, was like the difference between a 1908 Ford Model T and a 1959 Ford Galaxy. The Model T, available only in black, was a utilitarian piece of machinery intended for basic transportation, right? It was simply intended to get you from one part to the next. It was a basic need. The Galaxy, on the other hand, much like you would see in various models of the same type of car, you can get scaled down models, you can get upgraded models. It says the Galaxy, decked out in shiny chrome, was a way to show off and to enjoy a sense of luxury, not just to move from place to place. And one of the things that's true about the 1950s is we were more like the Ford Galaxy than we were the Model T. It says within a year or two, it would be obsolete as fashion changed. Blessed with abundant resources, America could afford to turn part of its productive capacity to creating glitz and fashionable waste. An older generation was careful to save and reuse. Many Americans in the 50s began to use and throw away. Okay? They became consumers. And this isn't hard for us to understand today because if you think about your cellular telephone, right, every year there's a brand new model and you have to get that new model. Why? Because it has better pixels or, you know, it has a faster speed because, the, uh, because there's like a 15G now or something, you know. Um, it's important to recognize that. You can see that also with, with vehicles of today, the brand new model, okay. It says consumerism was driven by advertising. Spending on product promotion boomed from $6 billion annually in 1950 to about $13 billion in 1963. It goes on to state here that the reason we have such a high standard of living, rant Robert Sarnoff, who was president of the National Broadcasting Company, which was NBC, he said the reason why we have such a high standard of living is because advertising has created an American frame of mind that makes people want more things, better things, and newer things. You know, we saw this during the 1920s, you know, uh, in advertising during the 1920s. Create a need that people didn't know they needed or wanted, right? And the 1950s was a time of consumerism. What I want for you to do now is to just to go ahead and click on the title of Booming Economy. It's an incredibly important video I want you to watch. It's going to talk more about this economy. Uh, and then once you're done, move on to the next slide. Okay, so what we've seen thus far is one facet of American society during the 1950s, a booming economy. And I, and I hope you paid attention to the film that you just watched because one of the things that you heard in there are, are – various baby boomers who said things like, you know, I couldn't want for anything. I couldn't have asked for anything. I had everything I wanted. While you have parents who are talking about things with respects to, you know, we gave them what they wanted, right? And when they rebelled against society, they couldn't quite understand exactly what certain people were rebelling about. And in fact, during the 1950s, you will have people known as rebels without a cause. Uh, and generally, they were referred to as beatniks. Uh, and they were the forerunners of the hippie movement, but essentially they were rebels, but they didn't have anything really to rebel against. Uh, and it was going to take something in order to give those, re those rebels some type of purpose. And as we will see with the hippies, it was the Vietnam War that did that. But the economy is incredibly important, okay? But it's only one facet of the 1950s. The other facet, of course, is a, is a burgeoning, developing youth culture, okay? It was a youth culture. It was one in which rock and roll music became a mainstay, and we'll talk more about rock and roll. It was a time in which television sets sort of defined popular culture and espoused it. It was also a time in which the youth of America were seen as becoming quasi-delinquent, right? They are becoming more independent than they ever had been before. They're, they're not listening to the music that their parents were listening to. They're dressing in a way that uh, is representative of something that they, they want to demonstrate. You know, the greaser sort of look, okay? And in some respects, the youth culture, excuse me, the youth culture must begin with a look at this sort of idea that maybe it's a problem. And then ultimately, what was it that caused this sort of belief that there was a problem. It says here that juvenile delinquency existed, right? It wasn't as if there were no gangs. It wasn't as if juvenile delinquency didn't exist before the 50s. It wasn't as if people hadn't rebelled against society before, 
But something unique happened in the 1950s, or at least people thought it was unique. It says fights among gang members, vandalism, car theft, and random violence were reported in the newspapers every day. Okay? It says, but youth gangs had been around for generations. So too had urban violence. It says a rapidly growing population of young people and extensive coverage by the mass media made the problem seem larger than it was. Okay? The truth of the matter is, is that during the 1950s, I think that the youth culture develops in its own unique way. But I think there had always been some type of a, of a youth culture. It's just here what you're seeing is it's exacerbated. The problems that parents see, uh, the changes in society, they're being exacerbated. They're being demonstrated through the media. It says young people adopted the fashions of gangs, the slang, leather jackets, and ducktail hairstyles. Right? It says, but then as now, most of these stylistically rebellious teens did not commit crimes or get in trouble with the police. Okay? The truth of the matter is, is that people even today will dress a certain way and they'll emulate certain cultural trends, but that doesn't mean that they're, they adhere to various ideologies. It could just be that they're adopting certain styles of dress. But that's part of what makes youth youth. It's part of what makes a teenage culture its own unique self. Okay? But during the 1950s, some parents were very concerned about what they saw was delinquency. Okay? Let's move on. So who were these supposed delinquents? Well, they were teenagers. Okay, it says the term teenager was rarely used before the 1950s, but it becomes more commonly employed during this time to delineate groups of people from, of course, 13 to 19 years of age. It says during the Eisenhower years, young people began to see themselves as a distinct group. Their attempts to forge an identity worried adults, and in fact, we saw that, you know, there is this sense that if you're wearing certain types of clothes or if you're listening to rock and roll music, which we'll talk about again a little bit later, then you have this sort of delinquent attitude, this delinquent sort of way of you. And many adults simply couldn't understand who these people were. These teenagers were coming in into themselves. It says here, young people occupied a distinctive place in post-war life. The children of the baby boom were becoming adolescents during the 1950s, and in the process, a distinctive teen subculture began to develop. Living amidst such a prosperous era, teenagers had more money and more free time than any previous generation. A vast new teen market arose for goods ranging from transistor radios, hula hoops, and rock and roll records, to cameras and surfboards, Seventeen magazine, and Pat Boone movies. It says, teenagers in the post-war era knew nothing of economic depressions or wartime rationing. Rather, immersed in abundance from an early age, these children of prospering parents took the notion of carefree consumption for granted. And they spent their money and time on a host of things. And if you read uh, below here, it says, much to the delight of young people, adults wrung their hands over their children's strange and worrying behaviors. And some people argued that it was comic books which were causing these delinquents. It was, it was rock and roll music, which was the devil's music, right? And we'll talk more about that, okay? But just understand that during the 1950s, these delinquents, quote unquote, these people were teenagers and they were developing for themselves a unique subculture, okay? All right, let's move on. It says, these youth owned cars, cruised the highways, and frequented fast food outlets and drive-in movies. They bought records and adopted rock and roll as the sound of their generation, and we'll talk more about what rock and roll was. It says rock was a form of music created specifically for teenagers, performed by young people, and marked by a more open sexuality than the kids' parents were used to. Especially when you take a look at someone like Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, right? Monikered Elvis the Pelvis uh, because of his dancing that went along with his singing okay it says popular radio disc jockeys like alan freed murray the k and wolfman jack became in a way unlikely authority figures for 50s youth it goes on to state here that but the youth movement of the 50s did not overturn society as some grown-up experts feared it would it says youth rebellion was aimed at parents and the confines of daily life not society as a whole you know, the Beats, who we'll talk a little bit more about this later, the Beatniks were not trying to overthrow society. Uh, what they were upset about was, in many ways, 
related to what the hippies of the counterculture were upset about, and that's consumerism, homogeneity, the idea that society is all the same, that there's no difference, right? So it says again, youth rebellion was aimed at parents and the confines of daily life, not at society as a whole. The only youthful rebels of the era who you might truly call revolutionary were the African Americans who participated in serious protest movements, and we're going to see this when we talk about the civil rights movement, okay? And these African Americans are attempting to overthrow society in a certain way. They're trying to overthrow racism and segregation, among other things, okay? It says most white teenagers did not concern themselves with social problems, and some educators refer to them as a silent generation. Like many in the 50s, they were restless, but as they grew up, they tended to adopt, uh, I'm sorry, they tended to adopt to the norms of the wider society. It says almost half of the young men of the era were drafted and served dutifully in the United States military. It says even Elvis Presley performed this duty, as we will see uh, later. Okay? Now, what I want for you to do is to uh, click on this link that says film. Uh, and take a look at that, and it's going to talk a bit more about this youth cult. All right. Probably the most lasting and perhaps most iconic component of the 1950s youth culture, which, of course, for many Americans, uh, they would have thought that this music uh, was the devil's music, and if you listened to it, it was going to send you to hell, and it was what was causing the the rebellion within the youth, but of course that is rock and roll. Okay, it says the cultural phenomenon of the Eisenhower era with the greatest long-term impact was the advent of rock and roll. It says in the mid-1950s, black and white music blended into a robust new hybrid. Right. In fact, rock and roll, in many respects, is is very. Um, uh, it's 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 in a, it's in a. I'm look I'm looking for the word. It's it's a blend of many different types. Uh, of, of, of other music. You've got uh, jazz music, you've got R&B, not R&B, you've, you've, you've got uh, blues, country, bluegrass, uh, a whole host of different types of, of music come together to create this newest sound. It's eclectic, that's the word I'm looking for. It's a very eclectic type of, of, of sound. It says, rock drew on the cultural culture of alienation, as well as the increased buying power and sense of identity of the nation's young people, right? The development of new technologies, for example, the transistor radio, allowed for teens to be able to listen to their own music on their own terms and in their own way, right? And because of this, more and more money was spent on rock and roll, and therefore music itself became not only an economic commodity, but it became a, a, a type of cultural expression. Uh, and again, for some parents, for, for many members of this white middle class society, rock and roll epitomized what was wrong, what was rebellious within society. It says, it's important to keep in mind, though, that the era had many types of popular music. Rock did not suddenly conquer all of it. Okay, And you can see I've, I've listed some other types of music there. Indeed, rock and roll was not the only thing that people were listening to, but it was one of the most significant because it was new. It was emerging, right? And it got people dancing, and it got people thinking, all right? And it made a lot of people famous. Okay, and we're going to be listening to a couple of these these songs, uh, these rock songs here in a little bit. Okay, all right, uh, let's move forward. All right, perhaps of all rock and roll artists in the 1950s, the most significant I would argue is Elvis Presley, and he shook the United States and shook the music industry on February 22nd, 1956, when he released his song called "Heartbreak Hotel." And if you click on that, what you'll get to do is you'll get to listen to Heartbreak Hotel, a, a live version of it from Elvis, and see him shake his pelvis, see him shake his hips, uh, where he got the moniker Elvis the Pelvis. Right? It says, Elvis had been stirring up increasing excitement among fans in the previous two years, but this was to be his first major hit. It says, Presley knew how to depict alienation. Right? He adopted this sort of alienated feel from various groups, including the Beats, including James Dean, who was the star of the film Rebel Without a Clause. Okay? Instead, he understood that gesture, sexuality, and attitude were as important as the music itself. Now, the reality is, is and, I, and I think one of the films mentions this, but that there was a disc jockey, or, or there was a, a musician, or a producer, I can't remember which, who said, if I could find a white man who sounded like a black man, I'd make a million dollars. 
Now, on its face, this is incredibly racist, and I do believe that it is, because what it attests to is that Americans as a whole really enjoyed African-American sounds, but they were not as willing to accept African-Americans. One of the things that made Elvis Presley so acceptable was that he was that. He was a white man who sounded like an African-American, and he brought to the forefront a new sound that was dubbed rock and roll. It says, the roots of rock and roll lay in African-American blues and gospel. As the Great Migration, uh, and the Great Migration was a time in which many African-Americans moved out of the South and moved up North. It says, as the Great Migration brought many African-Americans to the cities of the North, the sounds of rhythm and blues attracted suburban teens. And of course, these sounds were then copied and taken and manipulated uh, by a host of different artists, uh, a couple of whom you will see on the next slide. It says, due to segregation and racist attitudes, however, none of the greatest artists of the genre could get much airplay. Okay? Now, who really made the sound of rock and roll? I would argue it's Chuck Berry. Uh, and on the next slide, there's a link where you can listen to one of Chuck Berry's most famous songs, Johnny Be Good. Okay? Um, an incredibly important song. Uh, but there are other uh, artists as well, including Fats Domino and Little Richard. Uh, they began to enjoy broad success, right? But you also have some white odd, uh, artists. Uh, Buddy Holly and Jerry Lee Lewis, okay? Uh, the Big Bopper, all of whom were rock and roll icons uh, of the day. And again, uh, on the next slide, uh, on the top, where the title is, you'll be able to click on the word rock and the word roll and listen to two types of rock and roll music that, in some ways, are similar to Heartbreak Hotel uh, and in other ways are very different. But the sound of rock and roll, of course, was, was new, it was fresh, and for many Americans it was a sense of identity, it was a sense of cultural expression, uh, and they latched to it, okay? So if you have not yet done so, go ahead and click on Heartbreak Hotel, watch that, look at Mr. Elvis the Pelvis, and then we'll, we'll move forward. All right, it says here that rock and roll sent shockwaves across America. A generation of young teenagers collectively rebelled against the music their parents loved, which I don't think is uncommon for many generations, but it definitely was true here in, in the 1950s. It says, in general, the older generation loathed rock and roll. It says, appalled by the new styles of dance, as you saw with Elvis Presley, right? The movement evoked. Churches proclaimed it Satan's music, right? Uh, and this is something that you hear all the time uh, with, with, each, with each subsequent generation. It says, because rock and roll originated among the lower classes and a segregated ethnic group, many middle class whites thought it was tasteless. Rock and roll records were banned from many radio stations and hundreds of schools, but that didn't stop or slow necessarily its popularity. It says, other important rock artists, as I've mentioned of the day, included the Big Bopper, Buddy Holly, and Richie Valens. And in fact, if you've ever heard the song American Pie by Don McLean, he talks about the day that the music died. And when he's talking about the day that the music died, he's referring to the death of these three individuals who all died in February of 1959 on a plane crash. And as we will actually talk about later when we assess more deeply Don McLean's American Pie, what he's talking about is that music shifted. Something changed the day that these three individuals died. We shifted from something that made you want to dance, something very rock and roll, to something more folk and something different, something that was more politically charged, okay? But the point of the matter here is that rock and roll came to define the 1950s as far as music was concerned, and to this day we still have this idea of rock and roll with us, even if we don't call it rock and roll, okay? Now, we've already heard some music from Elvis, but I want you to click on the word rock, and there you're going to get um, Chuck Berry's little, not, you're going to get Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good, and then uh, click on the word roll, and you're going to get a very different sound, but still considered rock and roll. Uh, you're going to listen to a song written by Buddy Holly. Uh, and all three of these individuals were incredibly popular in their own right and contributed to rock and roll music in their own unique ways. Okay, But rock and roll, part of that youth culture, an expression of their identity. So go ahead and click on those uh, and see what you think. Okay, in addition to rock and roll, one of the other major pieces of 1950s culture was television. Okay, it says here that perhaps no phenomenon shaped American life in the 1950s more than television. At the end of World War II, the television was a toy for only a few thousand wealthy Americans, but this of course changes. Uh, it says just ten years later, nearly two-thirds of American households had a television, 
uh, in their home. And the point that needs to be understood here is that televisions were a purveyor of culture, right? They sort of set forth this idea about what society was like. And let's go ahead and think back to Stephanie Kuntz, who made the argument that even in today's society, in the 21st century, one of the things that helps us sort of remember, if you will, what the 1950s was like, you know, quote unquote, what it was like, was through the sitcoms, the reruns of these various shows, Ozzie and Harriet, Father Knows Best, right, Leave it to Beaver, those kinds of things, right? And the truth of it was is that these types of shows demonstrated a very homogenized type of identity that really only existed, I would argue, among white middle class families. Okay? It says television was the ultimate purveyor of mass culture. Before its arrival, people had to venture out to a theater or cinema, right? But now it could be pumped right into their front room. And of course, you guys know how, how television works, right? That's not new to you. Okay? Let's move on to the next slide. Now, who are the executives aimed at? Okay, initially, televisions were aimed, or television shows were aimed at more highbrow culture but that began to shift as time went along okay and it says that the reason why this highbrow uh, culture didn't work was because you only had a few wealthy people who were watching it and ratings weren't working it says advertisers initially pushed for the kind of mild entertainment that attracted the most viewers at first networks mounted serious dramas with top actors and writers but these shows appealed mainly to the wealthy who owned the first expensive television sets. But within a few years, as cheap TVs entered many more homes, different types of shows began to, 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 to present themselves, including Leave it to Beaver and The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. In fact, when we're done here, what I want you to do is to watch the clip that I have here of a Leave it to Beaver um, episode. And the interesting thing I want to highlight about that clip is, is the... Is the mentality about gender norms listen to what listen to what transpires between the father and the son in the first clip about what a woman's role is and what men do and then listen to the the clip the the, the dialogue that occurs between son and mother in the next clip and just think about what do these gender roles mean because it's important to understand that leave it to Beaver was an incredibly popular show and when it espoused a certain point of view, that view was very characteristic of the groups of people who watched that show. It doesn't necessarily mean that we should take it at face value and say that society at large was like that, okay? But do watch that clip, do take a look at it, and think about what it is that you see in here. Because what you're gonna see in here is a type of homogenized conformity, okay? The idea is that when you watch Leave it to Beaver, what that show is demonstrating or what it's espousing is this is what family life is like or this is at least what family life should be like right it's demonstrating a type of conforming society it says in my book America a narrative history in the 1950s social commentators mostly ignored people and cultures outside the middle class mainstream and that's important to recognize because television was paramount in the 1950s and today as Stephanie Kuntz again said we get our idea of what the 1950 is based upon these reruns, but it says that those marginalized groups, minority groups, were ignored. And so when you watch Leave it to Beaver, you're only getting a segment of the population. It says, as evidenced in many of the new look-alike suburbs, which sprouted up across the land, much of the middle-class social life during the two decades after the World War II exhibited an increasingly homogenized character. Suburban life encouraged uniformity. Okay? And you have to understand that one of the things that the beasts or the rebels without a cause are re rebelling against is this uniformity, this conformity. Right? One of the things that the counterculture is rebelling against is consumerism and uniformity. It says, in new communities of strangers, people felt a need for companionship and a sense of belonging. Changes in corporate life as well as the influence of the consumer culture also played an important socializing role. Conformity, predicted a journalist in 1954, may very well become the central social problem of this age. Too many people trying to act the same exact way, holding the same ideologies. And we're actually going to come back to this in a couple of weeks 
and look at the way that this sort of homogenized conforming mentality affected women and ultimately it too will result in a revolution if you want to call it that in second wave feminism during the latter part during the 60s and 70s okay but all that said television probably the most significant consumer commodity at the time a purveyor and developer and promoter of mass culture go ahead and take a look at some of that mass culture through the clip of leave it to beaver that i have there for you take a look at the homogenized way in which nuclear families are presented two sons husband wife she's inside he's outside listen to the gender roles okay because what we don't want to walk away from this today is to think that that was what life was like it was like that for a few people kind of all right all right watch that and then move on to the next slide Okay, if Leave it to Beaver depicted a homogenized, uniformed idea of American society, it says there was a flip side to this homogenized fare of TV. It says those who saw middle-brow books, TV shows, and movies as insipid, particularly with the prospect of a nuclear holocaust hanging over the world, they lashed out at the meaningless of it all. They said, look, this whole life that we have where we get up every day and we go to school and we go to work and we come home and mom cooks Rice Krispies treats and cleans the floor, right? What's the meaning in any of this? We are all conforming, we are all homogenized, we are all the same, and what's the point? What's the meaning? And so certain groups of people became culturally alienated. And these individuals were in many ways counterculturalists, right? They weren't called the hippies yet, which is a term that comes from the word hipster, but they were counterculturary, right? They were referred to as the beats or the beatniks. Okay, it says this sense of alienation from the mainstream was expressed in movies like Rebel Without a Cause, The Wild One, and Blackboard Jungle. These films depicted young people who were lost, directionless, and unhappy. And the truth of the matter is, is that many parents could not figure out why they were unhappy, what they were rebelling against. How could you rebel against a society that gave you everything? Since James Dean, who starred in Rebel Without a Cause, became a prime symbol of the misfit, right? This is a man who, in his early 20s, I think he was 23, he dies in a car crash as he's racing his poor spider, and he dies early on, you know? And this is a man who symbolized the rebellion of the age, and then he dies at a young age because he's reckless, right? And so this sort of sense of homogenization is attacked by these cultural alienated individuals right it's depicted in popular culture okay let's move on it said outside of hollywood the beats or the beatniks formed an artistic movement that challenged the dominant culture it says this small group of artists and writers formed in the early 1950s around poet allen ginsberg novelist jack kerouac and other bohemian writers all right. This is an obscenity trial in 1956 over Ginsburg's scandaling poem Howl brought the movement to national attention. It says that poem, with its frank references to sex and drugs and its blistering criticisms of modern life, set a tone that was picked up by other writers of the day. When you read Allen Ginsberg, when you read Jack Kerouac, and if you click on the word here on the road, you'll see there's a link there. It's going to take you to a Spark Notes um, explanation of what Jack Kerouac's On the Road was about. Go ahead and click on that when this is done here and read what he's talking about. Because you could look at the 1950s and say, leave it to Beaver is what the 1950s is like. You could just as easily read Jack Kerouac or Allen Ginsberg and feel this sort of alienation, feel that there was a type of oppression being felt and they were fighting against that and come to a very different conclusion about what the 1950s was. The 1950s was both things, okay? Jack Kerouac's novel On the Road, released a year later after Ginsburg's Howl, it says it became second pillar of the beat movement. Its depiction of a frantic but aimless wandering back and forth across the country rang true to a restless generation. Okay? The beats protested the hypocrisy of society and the sheer normalcy of the era. They wanted raw experiences oftentimes enhanced by drugs and drink. And one can say that the Beats were the forerunners of the hippies, okay? And, you know, if you want to get a sense or, or understand how the 1950s was not necessarily the Leave it to Beaver homogenized family, 
read these two artists among others and what you will find in there is a tension that exists between what Leave it the Beaver says and probably what was more true with many Americans okay all right I think I'm rambling now and a bit digressing so let's move forward okay it says it's worth noting two things about this alienated sector of culture first it was largely passive okay it was a passive culture it wasn't assertive it wasn't trying to overthrow society and this is why they were called rebels without a cause right they needed a rallying cry to sort of bring them together to give them purpose well that rallying cry had not yet occurred it was the Vietnam War that's really what gives the hippies their their ammunition but the beats these these rebels without a cause were largely passive for example it says in the wild one a girl asks Marlon Brando's character what are you rebelling against and instead of giving a very specific answer he simply says what do you got give me anything that's what I'm rebelling against right it says these quote-unquote rebels really had no cause it says the beats did not intend to start a revolution or to reform society they believed in the pursuit of happiness just like the suburban TV watcher only they pursued it in different ways it says when Jack Kerouac stated that if he had voted he would have voted for Eisenhower he was admitting that his political views were actually fairly conventional where the hippies would not have necessarily said something like that right they would not have been that conventional it says unlike the later rebels of the 1960s who aimed to overturn society the beats were seeking personal revelation not social revolution it says the other thing to remember is that mass culture swallowed all the reason why the beatniks were understood or known was because mass culture promoted them. Okay, it says the beats rose to prominence because they were depicted in the mass media. Had the mass media not paid any attention to them, probably they would not have been as well known. Okay? That the media picked them up meant that that they became popular. Okay? It says likewise, movies of alienation were marketed by savvy film producers to mass audiences. It says mass culture was able to co-opt that is diffuse the counterculture okay it was not able to do so in the 1960s and we will talk more about that when we get to the Vietnam War and speak more deliberately about the hippies but generally speaking what I have provided here is a, is a, is a general overview of the 1950s there's obviously a lot more to it but it's important to look at this so that we can assess it and that's what I want to do here really briefly how do we assess all of this what do we make of it Okay. It says many critics of the 50s looked on the audience as victims of some kind of cultural conspiracy. Comic books corrupted the young, rock and roll encouraged rebellion, television dulled the mind. It says there was some truth in these assertions, but there was no conspiracy. Mass culture gave mass audiences what they wanted. Nothing was foisted on the public, right? You didn't have to watch the TV show. You didn't have to buy the record. You had the power to refuse mass culture but that's what people wanted there was no conspiracy to overthrow society there was no major rebellion going on okay this is what it says and I'm gonna conclude with reading this it says in America narrative history rock and roll would become one of the major vehicles of the youth revolt of the 60s in the 1950s however it had little impact on the prevailing patterns of social and cultural life the same held true for most of the critics who attacked the smug conformity and excessive materialism they saw pervading their society. The public had become weary of larger social or political concerns in the aftermath of the Depression and the war. Instead, Americans eagerly focused on personal and family goals and material achievements, and that's where this economic boom really was helpful. It says, yet those achievements, considerable as they were, eventually created a new set of of problems and those problems would come to a forefront during the 1960s fueled on by civil rights and the Vietnam War these problems would create the hippies and it would create student protests and it would be manifested through a series of different mass production commodities including folk music the voices were different the message was different okay no longer is it rock and roll, but it is folk. No longer is it Elvis, but it's Bob Dylan. Okay? All right, guys, that is a quick overview of the 1950s. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. All right, guys, uh, go in peace, be warm and filled, and may the force be with you.